in Bradford in 1901. Douglas Rawson, seen here with Susie, bought his 1952 Jarrett Javelin second-hand in 56 for £600. The reason I chose it is, it was quite magical in its ability to cover ground quickly without drama. It was quite exceptional in its sort of joie de vivre of um, driving in a spirited manner without getting into mischief. The Jowett brothers began by building factory machinery for local mills. In 1906 they built their first car and soon got a reputation for solid, no-nonsense vehicles. In 1946, Jowett launched the Bradford van. Pre-war in its design, it was simple, noisy and slow, but a good earner for the company. It was followed by two all-new cars, the Javelin and the Sporting Jupiter, intended for the US market. The man responsible for the radically new Javelin was Gerald Palmer, a young designer from Morris Motors. This photograph shows an early prototype. On the back, in Gerald's hand, it reads, Plans are going ahead to make this in thousands. He was right and in 1947 the Javelin went on sale with the slogan Take a good look as it passes you. The production line was quite unique. In fact, it, the, the Javelin was the only car in the world to be built upside down. Of course, when it got to the end of the production line and turned over, there was a surplus uh, nuts and bolts fell off and a bit of a rattle. But uh, the wheels went on and it went out of the door. Compared to other cars of the day, it gave a sure-footed ride due to its independent front suspension and low flat-four engine. For Douglas, visiting his family on a thousand-mile round trip from Doon Ray to Leeds, that was important. It made light of a long journey and there weren't many cars could do that. You had to steer them, you had to anticipate bad cambers. This was a car you could throw about with um, pleasure and safety, I should say. The Javelin had been honed on Jowett's local proving ground, the Yorkshire Dales, test driven by Phil Green. Our 200 mile route started from the factory through Otley, came up this road here over to Blubber Houses, over to Pateley Bridge and up Wharfdale, then on the A1, a fast belt on the Europe carriageway. By the time a car had done that for 12 weeks non-stop, you knew you'd got a motor car. But as well as being tough enough to cope with the Dales, even in the worst of weather, the Jowett looked good. It was one of the first British cars to have the American streamlined look, instead of separate lights and wings. It was also very aerodynamic, even though it had never been near a wind tunnel. The particularly interesting taper in at the back here, to uh, not cause too much turbulence at the rear. For instance, one never needed a rear wiper. It simply didn't get clarted up in the Yorkshire expression. The boat's deceptively large, with a rather clever hinge, it doesn't trap your luggage as it shuts. And so that the boot didn't get clarted up, the spare wheel was kept in a tray under the floor. Put your wheelbase on here and simply wind it down. And it comes out here, as they say. <sighs> One clean spare wheel, it's been, uh, I suppose, two or three years. <laughs> I once had a front wheel flat at 50 miles an hour, which might have been alarming. In fact, uh, I kept the rest without any drama at all, to my surprise. And uh, I subsequently learned that was to be expected. But the low, flat four engine was lost under the streamlined nose, and to get at it required some unconventional answers. How awful! How on earth do you do anything under there? Well. This is how you do it. You look under there, 
Or better still, go and build these little screws. If you're going to do anything serious, uh, then two cylinders, two cylinders, horizontally opposed, flat four. Everything's extremely easy to get at, except the back two plugs, which are a little bit dirty, but you can reach them down there. It was Yorkshire in that people expected it to be treated badly, to be treated hard. If you stood on it, for instance, um, you don't do that on modern bumpers, you know. <laughs> These were the usual instruments of the day. You've got oil pressure, water temperature, fuel, of course, and the amps. You needed to know how many amps you were charging. The clutch is of the feather light variety. I think I can press it down with my fingers. No, <laughs> it's too easy. But it wasn't that easy for Jowett. At 1,100 pounds new, the Javelin was an expensive car. To reduce costs, its gearbox production was moved from precision engineers in the Midlands to the home factories in Bradford. But quality suffered. Jowett couldn't produce enough gearboxes. Cars waiting for gearboxes began to stockpile and sales slumped. As a small, independent manufacturer, Jowett didn't have the resources to survive and in 1953 stopped production. Unlike Jowett, the Roots Group was one of the biggest independent manufacturers in the country. Humber was their flagship. It was the 1952 Super Snipe Mark III. Bought it in 1956. If I'd been married then, I probably wouldn't have had it. <laughs> John Easton bought his Super Snipe from a Lord Mayor for £650. Roots took over the Humber and Hillman car companies in the 20s and started building the Super Snipe in the 30s. They weren't in the same class as a Rolls, more your politicians or film stars car. And John, a cinema projectionist, saw these stars every day on the big screen. His leading lady was his very own super snipe. The car was his whole life, his pride and joy. It was quite a standard joke, really, that he'd part with me long before he'd part with the car. <laughs> John used the car as the family run around. The difference was, this car could carry more than one family. Oh, I suppose we must have had eight or nine in it when we used to go and visit my sister in Romford. Mother, Grandma, me, you, and children. Barbara, Sometimes we had Ian, Barbara's yeah. children. And with so many in the car, it left little room for the pram. John much preferred to take all the wheels off of the pram and put it all back together again when we arrived anywhere, rather than get rid of this car and have a sensible car. <laughs> well, I thought we, we wouldn't have a pram forever, would we? But once the car had gone, it had gone. The Humber's luxurious pre-war design was out of place in post-war Britain but it gave Roots some style. I'll open the bonnet. Four litre side valve. Nice plodder. Plenty of room to work, but the easiest way I've found is to actually get in the engine and then you can work on the rear, which is very handy when it's raining. The interior is trimmed with leather, Bakelite and enamel paint. That slight noise there is the heater. Let me turn that off, the blower. It's very quiet clock, you can't hear it ticking. 
the wipers, you can either have one or two. But sitting here, you don't really need that one. Beautiful. Real wood, not plastic. Today, they couldn't afford to build it like this, with all nuts and bolts. I think it's remarkable, really. No cigarette lighters. Cigar lighters in Humbers. But cigar-smoking Humber buyers were getting harder to find. It was expensive to build, a reliable, if dated, throwback to a lost era. Root's basic Hillman cars were badged as Humber or Sunbeam. This way, a range of family cars could be assembled more cheaply. But for many, the spirit of Root's flagship mark had been lost. Humber Scepter, it's a nice Hillman, but um, it's still got the Humber name on it. <laughs> 